So, uh, Josh, thank you so much. I'm very grateful to Josh Taka, to the NYU, to all people here. Uh, because of them, I'm, uh, you know, I was able to leave Russia and I have a job. I, you know, just leave Russia and uh, not work. So it's it's lovely here. It's very uh, interesting, you know, uh, prospects. I will be teaching beginning of January, so it's also nice because in, in Russia all my uh, uh, classes uh, were closed, and I was teaching, you know, the federal regime, state of democracy, kind of ridiculous stuff in my part of the world. So anyway, and so I'm very grateful to uh, Josh and to the department, and of course, you know, to Sasha, who is just a delicate personnel who's doing everything, including lifting tables, <laughs> uh, for uh, for opportunity to run the series. It's so that, you know, uh, you can mark your calendar, we're going to have uh, Season glass of the New York Tito Baker or you know the Chief White House performance with the New York Times on October 7th. We will have Sergei Guriev uh, Sergei Guriev on September the 29th. Uh, we are going to have Professor Angela Stand, formerly Chief Intelligence Officer, Professor at Church Town University and currently with Brooklyn as well. On October 27th, they will be able to put them November 17th, and so good. So, anyway, I really believe that you know, journalists uh, should have an opportunity to meet with the well known people and learn how to ask questions and talk, pop them in the eye, and you know, do the kind of job that is invaluable for any society. Unfortunately, back in Russia, we lost this opportunity to ask questions and to control people in power as a result. Uh, we uh, got uh, where we got now with this war and etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, today my first gay guest in this series, you should be very proud that you are going to meet this wonderful woman. Besides that, she is of course beautiful, but that's I know in the United States you shouldn't say this, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but you know she's amazing personality. Trust me, uh, Maria Pierce. Uh, she is uh, a chief investigator in Navalny's Anti Corruption Foundation. She's in charge, well, I'd say Navalny, of course, is sitting in the maximum security panel calling her right now. We can talk about this later. Uh, Marie is right, is running his uh, YouTube channels um, out of uh, Vilnius. Uh, but you know what's most interesting for the purpose of this interview is that, that apparently she was behind all the niche interviews that were done by Navalny. We didn't know that. Trust me, I know a thing or two about Navalny, and I know him for a couple of decades, but you know, there were all these gossips in Moscow, you know, in the position circles that there is a, some woman in London who is working for Navalny, who is working with, who is in the, some corporates, uh, finances or something like that, who has access to different data, and she's doing, you know, she's doing these amazing investigations that uh, they started to leave in the beginning of uh, 2012, 13, and so forth. It's not that Navalny didn't do, uh, you know, himself something before, but the kind of quality of investigation that came uh, when, you know, uh, this, everyone started talking about this young woman in London, it was just absolutely amazing. And we were guessing and gossiping and such. And then when on uh, August 20th, uh, 2020, I'd seen Awani got poisoned in the city of Tokyo. With, as we now well aware, he was poisoned uh, with a uh, military agent, uh, Medicho. And that's how we got to see Marie Pierchuk, who was with uh, IHC in Tons, that the whole group of people was there. They were shooting some investigation. And so uh, all of a sudden, when uh, uh, IHC was, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, they got him to a hospital in uh, Omsk, uh, somebody said, oh, look, this is this woman who is making this speech. And that was Maria Pierce. Uh, Maria graduated from uh, the Department of Sociology of the Moscow University. 
Then she moved to London and uh, she did her BA in government in the London School of Economics. Uh, so apparently, she doesn't have uh, any uh, study in journalism, and she has never, as far as I understand, never worked for uh, any professional publication before she joined Anti Corruption Federation in Moscow. And I myself, I, I to be honest with you, I'm very interested in this story because it is something that's unique. I've been in journalism for the last 45 years of my life. And I thought that I know everyone and, and everybody, and I more or less understand how people do what they do. And I leave myself certain investigations. But the kind of stuff that Maria does, I just don't even understand how she does. It's absolutely amazing uh, discoveries that she and her people in the Anti-Nanawalian uh, Anti-Corruption Foundation are uh, doing. So, Marsha, tell me. How did it happen that you decided to do investigations? Wow. Well. <laughs> right, well, that's what I would like to say. You fell in love with who? Mm -hmm. You fell in love with who? No? Okay. no, no. <laughs> um, um, so first of all, let me just say hi to everybody. It's an honor to be here and to be the first in the series of one of the events. I feel like a warm-up band before the real bands that are going to be here later. Um, and um, you say it's it's one of the um, first times I'm speaking at such establishments, and um, I hope that I will do everything right. Um, answering your question about how I got into investigations, um, I took a um, very unusual political route. Essentially, Navalny has always been using investigations as a political tool. It was never about investigating journalism as a genre. We never tried to fit in. We never tried to copy. Russian investigative outlets. Actually, we wanted to do the opposite. They go very, they existed back then, like Tabata and Vietnam did the thing here and there. Um, they were very toned down. They would do, oh, let's so like Nova Gazeta, the amount of arguments I had with their investigations, they were just like, you should, you should let both sides speak. You should be objective, you should be do that. And uh, me and Lexi, we decided to do differently, to if something essentially looks like a um, person is a criminal, we would say it. So if someone looks like a crook, we would call him a crook. If someone is, that looks like he's stealing from a state-owned company, we would just say it as it is and then face the risks. And also um, another thing that you I call, I'm sorry, you, are, you call a criminal a criminal yes. as a crook before proving a guilty? Yeah. Wow. Okay. And there is no not our way of doing stuff. Well, I'm not sure. I, I think there has to be a different way of doing stuff in the in the country where legal system does exist, where, where it is not possible to prove that someone is guilty. So in there's different circumstances, different rules have to be created. It still would be just silly and not not logical to expect a court decision in the country where the where we are making an investigation about a prosecutor general like he's not going to investigate himself uh, or his own family so we decided to be bold and brave and also another thing that made us stand out was the fact that we had uh, always had a legal department like a bunch of lawyers who would go line line by line on every investigation that we publish and find every single violation of the russian criminal code or the other uh, potential uh, laws uh like procurement laws name it and they would file complaints those complaints of course would never i mean in the beginning we managed to cancel quite a few procurement contracts and some of the deals were reverted but that was and one member of parliament even resigned you remember getting him over his flats in miami you know you look broke as a church mouse member of parliament and then we find like six flats in miami um so um and i would i have to be frank here we used it as a political tool it was never about journalism for us. It was never about the art of, you know, putting words into a sentence. Uh, to, to be frank, I hate writing, and the fact that Alexei Navalny hates writing as well. So we've never enjoyed the process. We've enjoyed the political impact that it gives. Just completely randomly and accidentally, we stumbled upon something that really resonates with the Russian audience and these investigations that were full of um, jokes, memes, funny things and just very down to earth, really not highbrow at all. Um turns out that um they they really worked and they still work, I think. 
Okay, uh, so tell me about yourself. You know, because you, you are trying to avoid this and trust me, you know, I'm not going to, to let you do this. So tell me, how did it happen that without any experience in journalism, all of a sudden you, so you what, you came to Navalny's office on Padamka in Moscow mm -hmm. and said what? Um, he was, he posted a job advert for um, a skilled lawyer. So that was the job for a government procurement lawyer. And someone who would study government contracts and you know do very very manual like boring work bringing out you know making complaints bringing them to court attending the court hearing and they're always the same really dark really important jobs so, but i realized i was reading his live journal for ages but then i realized okay well, it's actually possible to work um uh, for the guy as well so i um responded to this um to to, to, to this jail job advert saying like i probably don't fit like i'll be able to do the job i'm not a lawyer uh, but I don't know, can I be useful in any other way? Um, and yeah, I went to well, I went for an interview. Um, and? and we, he, he told me I'm unfit for the job. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, the, um, the board saw it, so those who follow us would know her, she's the one who got the job. Yes, um, but the board saw when uh, she was a lawyer at uh, Navalny's office, one of the first lawyers to join Navalny's office. She also was involved in several investigations, tried to run for the office mm -hmm. several times. She, uh, and she, it's amazing to see how you were just grew over the years because, you know, we called her a wooden politician. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, she's just now, and she's just real good with, uh, with people on the streets and with the crowd and etc. okay? Yeah, so she got the job uh, and I got a very vague Just a lawyer. Yeah, she got the job. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I got a very vague um, proposition of let's do something cool. Hmm. And that was the time of, well, Alexei just started his investigation into BTB Bank and the oil drills. Um, so that the was. State the state owned bank. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And how they would purchase Chinese oil drinks, but not the drills, but not directly, but rather through an intermediary company in Cyprus owned by BTB Management. Um, so the management would be benefiting from, from, from those contracts. Uh, so he started working on that, and I kind of like joined halfway through that investigation and then helped finish it and um, helped figure out who owns the uh, firm in Cyprus. Um, and, you know, one thing led to another. Um, there would be something else. I started like with very, very basic research assignments. He would ask me to figure out, I don't know, say, for example, there is a building in, in London that belongs to BTB bank, Russian history bank, and it was also purchased from Chinese. So I would study the history of that building. Um, I would, it was very research based. All, I can imagine this sort of job existing at a university. Um, you know, you are giving a topic, you're giving a couple of days to figure out how things work. Um, and yeah, then things just escalated. I, sometimes, you know, when, you, um, when you're doing something that you are meant to do, that you are really happy to do and um, your the pace of your progress is probably much faster than the organic route would be um i we, we can we progress through this faster at, compared to if i studied they did a degree in journalism or anything like that and we weren't the one isn't a journalist either he's a lawyer so none of us were you know constricted by any rules or you know things that we were taught at university it was very intuitive and then I think the first, we've done um, from 2007 to 2013, we've done a couple of small investigations, like about very simple, just property register. Nobody could, nobody knew how to do it back then. So this is why we were so How cool. did you know? Well, you just like Google Miami property register, figure out how it works. Sometimes you can search by name. Sometimes you can search by address in different jurisdictions, different states, it's different for it a county within a state. It's different. Then we would do the same for London, then we would do the same for France, figure out here and there, and then just like it's it's nothing. We've never had any insider knowledge or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Our investigations up until 2018, probably 19 million, they were completely open source public. And just people had no idea that those sorts of databases existed, that it was possible to get access to them. Um, and this all was very, very new. Um, and we just like capitalized on that. We, um, and then YouTube started. Um, Why did that one entrust you with the job? I have not done it. He didn't. I'm serious. You know, it's very interesting because there already was 
uh, frequently in jails. So, you know, he knew that FSB was trying to implant uh, different agents yeah. around him. And basically, we all knew that, uh, you know, uh, the most radical groups were, were infiltrated uh, with the secret police agents. Yeah. So, I assume that uh, he had to be very cautious. So I hide that. Did you have a reference? A reference? No? Wow, amazing. Okay. I, I, I really hope that you will actually have a chance to ask him why, why, yes, why he yeah, trusted me and he will be able to tell me why. But sometimes, I don't know why did I trust him. He could have also been anybody. You know, like, well, in 2012? Yeah. You know, there was well, there was no personnel. I know, but there were rumors, you know, who is, who is controlling him, who is he acting, you know, all of this propaganda mess. It was all that. Sometimes you just act on, on, on trust. And I guess uh, through the years, um, I've, I've proved myself as a trustworthy individual. Right. So, uh, what was your first independent investigation? From the big ones? Yes. I did like little smaller ones on, on, on Sabanian's daughters, but that's nothing. Uh, um, uh, Russian Railways. Sabanian was the mayor of Moscow. Yeah, that was during the mayoral campaign. His daughter had uh, what, the past Just properties, property. just properties everywhere okay. in Moscow. And so um, um, the one that I did on my own was the big one. It was uh, Russian Railways, and it was about the head of Russian Railways, Vladimir Putin, who was a symbol back then. He was a member of Cooperative Ozera, if, 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 if that's like an inner Putin circle. Um, and he was very flashy. He was very was wearing those very expensive suits, watches. He was living this he spent quite some time in New York City, being deputy resident here in New York City to work uh, for the nation, yeah, nations. But in fact, you know, he was in charge of uh, so-called line T, scientific technological intelligence, and was deputy resident of the city. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, and. Um, we found out that uh, just by looking through who is supplying what for the Russian railways, we um, found out that a very big uh, chunk of, of, of the contract um, contracts are actually performed by this firm registered in uh, Cyprus, and um, actually went to Cyprus uh, to the to, to the office of this lawyers. The lawyer was uh, they opened the door for me and and. Um, I was trying to establish that how it works, the Cypriot companies, who are they? You know, it's all registered in nominees, no one really knows the real law mm -hmm. owner. I walked in into the office of this lawyer, someone in Lima saw that thing. The guy, the lawyer, was like 120 years old or something, very chatty, very chatty. It was very lonely. Thank you. Know, so and um, and um, so he like he just spilled the bins. He was like, oh, we did this, we do that, you just pay us. So I pretended that I wanted to open an offer account and, and, and I don't want my name anywhere. And he said, okay, like 200 bucks, we'll do this. Then you pay me 10,000 a year and I put my name instead of yours on the records for the beneficial owners. Then if he wants to do you know, this and that, like he explained how this whole industry works. And then later on, we managed to, 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 to find out that uh, the, the ultimate beneficial owners of those Cypriot firms are children of uh, Vladimir Ikunin and uh, that is a massive conflict of interest and by that time they have earned so much money that the elder son um andre moved to london bought himself a huge house um somewhere in Golders green his youngest son victor, son victor moved to switzerland he lived in geneva you know like it was all they they had money for a while and we um we um i remember drawing this gigantic um that spider gram of those companies and russian railways and all of that um on the bottom sheet of paper essentially well, main sheets of paper kind of glued together um and um i brought it um back to Navalny and said like that's it and um we we yeah, he 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 worked he worked on the investigations a lot like he is um, if anything, he is a very, very tough editor. Um, and that would always like say, okay, this is not done properly, you have to reinvestigate and you know, prove blah, blah, and all that. Um, and we published a Russian Railways investigation on the day of his um, arrest on Hirapies. Uh, because we just didn't want this arrest to go, you know, unnoticed. There was always this power trial, you know, when they do something bad to us, we always have to respond to see. Stalis, for example, many years later. Um, so we expected that Navalny would be arrested on, 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 on this case. 
So on that thing on 18th of July 2013, we just dropped that form. And that was that big, I think was the biggest investigation um in the industry, you know, like newspapers we won't do the scale of it, just going through we can't really fit it into, you know, a couple of um just a couple of pages. Um so yeah, they were shocked at near scale. Did you have a peep? Did someone keep you? No. So but how did, did, did you know where to go? How did you find out that uh, uh, you put in San uh, had a house in uh, one? I think we started with, we were, we were doing other things on the side back then. We were also, it was pre drone era, so drones didn't exist back then. So we hired a guy who would fly um, something, I don't even know what, what it's called, you know, the thing with the, um, like a parachute with a propeller, you know, that's that the very glider, very I think light. that's that's my big the word. And he would fly with camera, with a big camera holding held in his hand over um expensive areas in the block and similar areas and out of like in the you know Moscow region um and just take pictures of everything he sees and then he would give it back to us and we would using land register check who's what's what. Okay, we see this building, we'll look it up, okay, that's that guy. And during this sort of exercise, we, we flew over this um, um, area where you couldn't live. Chambers at least there as well. Like, it's a big, like quite a big uh, chunk of, of, of like, people um, live there together. Um, we found Nikunin's house, it was very impressive. And I think that uh, the logic was just let's look into him. And here you know, that, and that, and that we started looking into him. This is just so that was before drones. Yeah, well, people drones. Because you know, basically, you were the first to start using drones. Yeah, it's a real investigation. Yes, but before that, because before that, we used a real person, and each time he flew, I would, would go with it's not the field, it's independent of us. Like, I would drive him to the field, and he or, or my colleague, Gary Albura, would do the same. Like, we would stand there, like, freezing, watching him and fly. And every time he did it, it was just like a micro heart attack for me every time because. What if they shoot? Like, what if something goes wrong? What right. if the security person decides to just take a rifle? And um, mm -hmm. so it was, it was nerve wracking every time. Um, and he almost collapsed over um, um, was it was a Chaika's house. And like, and we had to retreat. Procurator the general. Um, yeah, for Chaika, Procurator general. Yes, a general. Yeah, like, we had to retreat him from like a <laughs> snow in the middle of the field. And you never got caught by, because you know, these kind of actions, they usually control, but they are usually. Are guarded by the uh, people from the, yeah. the special department of the FSB, you know, for so. I mean, we so, would get sometimes caught, but then what can they do? They would uh, just tell but us. But even off. when you had a guy flying over the Dutchess and there was no control of the skies, unbelievable, you know. Sometimes, you know, I feel like we live in different countries. I mean, we still fly drones over those places. Now if they have more control because they have like all the anti drone equipment, but back then in 2013. Tell me, you know, uh, they, you know, uh, Elvoka did an amazing investigation on the former president of Russia, Mr. Medvedev, who was intermediate president between two countries. Uh, you also, you know, you did, you know, this drone uh, shooting of, you know, so, and everybody kept asking, wait a second, he was the former president, he was still under um, protection of the uh, federal security office, federal security federal security federal security service. Sorry, and so because you know he was uh, the former president. So how did they allow you to ask for permission? No, no, I understand that they did. You know why they didn't kill you? You know why they didn't shoot your draw? Uh, it, it's not me who is asking, I know the answer, but you know, there were time and again this kind of questions, they were brought about on the web, and you know, uh, people were asking. So, why did FSO or Federal Security Service allow you to do this? Um, again, just to emphasize, they didn't allow us to do anything. Uh, Russian Secret yeah, Service. Still alive, so they did. Uh, Russian, <laughs> or, uh, 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 yeah, they tried to kill Alexei, so that's All right. That's right, right. Right. Um, there are Russian secret services. Anybody who's seen the Navalny, the movie, the documentary, that's the Russian secret services are pretty shit. Mm -hmm. um, and 
for this corruption and negligence and lack of professionalism um, within the Russian security services, um, they convert into they convert it, convert into things like that. Medvedev is completely it's nobody. And any when any but there is this Russian um, TV presented and there's a new personality who keeps not believing um, that uh, it's possible to buy drones and he says this is why our investigations are um, uh, but people tend to forget that the, that specific residence that we filmed, it wasn't in his official residence. It belongs to to, to, to to oligarchs to to well to a firm that were sponsored by Amy Hinson. Um, and, and, and someone else. No, but the guy who owns yeah, yeah, one yeah. of the biggest yeah. the guest stuff in the company. Yes, so yeah, okay, we did leave there, but how would you request like proper protection and security services if, if you are living in a house that technically belongs to an oligarch? So that's that's not that not state residence, so it's not protected by episode at all. So filming the video wasn't even like we did it with a commercial drone that we can get like in any shop. Uh, but we did film official residences as well, like Putin's residences. We filmed Putin's palace. Okay, that's not official, but we filmed filmed uh, all day. The um, residence um, no, up north towards St. Petersburg, um, which is an acting one of my favorite Putin's residence residences where he spends time. That's where he has massive construction, so he invests into there. And that's the, probably after Nova Berova, that's the second uh, biggest and uh, most important residence. We flew the drone over it last year. Um, I believe we had something like 18 residents yeah, all yeah, yeah. the country. And again, it was so possible. Now it's possible with technology, you can upgrade your drones, you can hack them, you can make them um, avoid the anti-drone equipment and ignore it. Um, so there are ways to do it. And also anti-drone equipment. It's not perfect as well, as we found out um, uh, when we were filming Miller, Alexei Miller in New York. That was difficult. Alexei Miller is the chairman of uh, the Gazprom company. He built himself a palace which mimics Versailles. Yeah. <laughs> and so it is absolute, and that was the second one. And this is a separate story that, you know, maybe Marshall will uh, say it in five minutes how they just found out, and how they not just found out. That this house belongs and there is from one uh, side of the palace to another, it took 80 minutes to walk. It was just ridiculously huge. He's not a crazy guy, you know. So, I mean, you know, in terms of you know all this luxury. But what's important that they managed to prove that in fact it was his palace, not just somebody else. Can you uh, talk well, about that? I'm still in the I'm still drones. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but you also use drones with yeah, the, yeah, yeah. He like... has they do they do use the equipment that just shuts the drone down and just forces it to land <clears throat> wherever it is. Um, but we manage we work with drone professionals to be able to tweak it in a way, but it ignores this command. Sometimes you can see in some of our videos, I think we posted it, that someone was shooting with an anti-drone rifle to the drone. Um, so all you see is kind of what you see a person pointing at, at the drone, and then it's kind of like a little flash, which I guess is, me is, 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 is meant to just, you know, some wiring sort of thing to, to, to slow up the wire sense, to disconnect all of the electronics and um, software side of the drone. Um, sometimes they miss, sometimes, sometimes we lose drones. Sometimes we buy, like sometimes I like buy five drones a month, but that's that's part of the job. Um, and I believe drones are prohibited for use in Russian situation, right? No, I mean it's a gray area. In like, some, uh, it's, yes, it's, like in it's, some parts it's, of the it's country, regulated right. by the weight of the right. drone, and now weight, huh. and, and now the drones are super light, so technically it's no longer prohibited. So they have to adjust the law a little bit. It's a gray area, but again, we just ignore it. It's just, like, we just don't know what's completely. If it is everywhere, we would still do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> very nice. Uh, so, you know, it would have, you know, trust me, you have to ask a question about how they found this palace or how they proved. But, you know, we will move, you know, uh, we'll move to this uh, next subject. Tell me, just recently, uh, you did an investigation on Putin's, uh, but some. Amazingly expensive, full of gold, and apparently Putin is totally crazy about gold. You know, he's using, you know, he's, you know, he just gold is something that from his poor upbringing, you know, 
he's just crazy about this map. Anyway, so uh, this book is Shekhanin's track and his other. Tell me, how did who tip you? How did you get a tip on that? How did you know that it was Putin's? Mm -hmm. How did you get the interior? Because, you know, apparently they managed to fill the in, uh, the inside the, uh, you know, rooms and designs of uh, this Putin's book. Thank you. Um, the, this yacht, um, Toshi Herodot, um, it's, well, I'll tell you soon. If the yacht is within top 50, size-wise and value-wise in, in the world, and it's being built from scratch, people will know. It's like, did you, I don't know, when in London they were building this skyscraper called Shards, people knew, you know, like you can see, people know they're working in the industry, that something big is, is, is being built. I'm sure it's the same way in New York. So the same principle applies to the yachts, to, 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 to the yachts, uh, um, and probably, yeah, uh, airplanes, sometimes private jets, sometimes. So uh, we found out that something enormous is being built when it was not even half done. So we knew that there, um, in Germany, in this Larsen um, company, very famous um, chip building company, that they are constructing um, 10 most impressive yachts in the world. Um, and that was it. Um, that's what that's it was probably we read it in one of the like yachts in magazines, so it's just quite interesting. And I think they named that as a Russian fire, but you know, back then every every other yacht was owned by a Russian uh, person, so that wasn't a surprise. Maybe sometime later, uh, we started um, to receive um, um, leaks from uh, messages on, on, on our secure channel um, from an employee of um, um, a company that manages yachts, so a company that would be responsible for uh, probably decorating it, uh, providing staff, uh, hiring people, buying people, um, food supplies, catering, that sort of thing. And the, the origi original leak was it's being built for Putin. Uh, me and probably back then, I'd say was still um, was still around back then. We uh, and my colleague Jorge, we probably just had a laugh because you know if we, whenever foreigners see anything big and flash of it takes it's, 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 it's sure and then of course it's stupid stupid german so um, <laughs> which already has it looks like and it's pretty good like why, why would why would we have another one um and then it just we started to get more and more of those then in the end of the day crew member um has emailed us uh that crew member worked on, uh, I think, on Medvedev's yacht before, so we sent up shared sort of infrastructure there. And uh, he said that definitely Putin's. Um, we are building everything according to his requests. Um, it's called, she's going to be called Sherazad after Alina Kabayev, Putin's girlfriend, because that was her nickname when she was a gymnast. <laughs> um, and this is when we started to get like a little bit more serious about it. Uh, but we have to wait until the, the construction is over. We didn't film it. It's discovered in a dock. Uh, it's somewhere in Germany. So we literally will wait. It. it was back in like 2019, maybe 2020. We waited for it to be complete and then it went to Italy. And then finally, we were we were observing it like all the time live. And then it went to Sochi. How did you? Wait, did you plant the GPS? No, no, no. Marine, marine, marine tracking websites do that. We don't okay. You can just type out the number. So. Mm -hmm. okay. And then it's one Sochi. And we were like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Must> <laughs> be <true. laughs> Because what that? I mean, why else? So we, we saw it going through, through from Mediterranean Sea to the Black Sea. It parked pretty close. To Putin's right residence, which was the who was parked in a very, very specific um, part of the port, which is controlled by the Federal Security Office by the So, so kind of all, everything pointed at this, but we couldn't prove it for more than a year. Um, then the, um, it was just, we have loads of stories like that just right now, you know, that are just sitting there and we you know, slowly could maybe one day we'll cover just a little bit more. So it was one of those stories. And then, um, when the war started, um, I think New York Times 
uh, published a big mm -hmm. this book. Yes, this book. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, published a big piece on Jihadizad, uh, saying similar things. They had sources somewhere, like they kind of did it, like they managed to confirm a little bit more uh, than, than we thought we knew. And at this point, um, they started to arrest um, and freeze assets of sanctioned individuals abroad. And then this was the day when we sat down in the office um, and we said, okay, well, we have to prove it because that, we can seize it. That's perfect. That personal freedom's vote, we have to prove it. And we sat down one evening in Vilnius and just tried to, tried to think like what, what would be the way of proving that Putin actually used it or like, I don't know, that he, he it was being built for him. And we couldn't figure out it for a long while until we asked, um, until our source, with, with the pictures, he sent us um, a crew list. So it's a list of members of whoever was on the yacht on that day. And we went through this, through this list, everybody there were Russian, and we just decided to check every single person. There were about 50 people. And as we were going down the list of crew members, uh, using all of these apps so that you know that can trace you and tell you know your car registration plates and things like that. You know, this dark black gray market sort of apps. Um, and we were going down the list, turned out that one is working for the federal security of the second one, third one, fourth one. For where for the seventh street service. Yeah, and then we checked their plane tickets and it turned for out that they, and they were on the app. And under their own names, but these are like their security guards. Right. I mean, why not? Mm -hmm. Their they they their description would say by in their chest, but it wasn't this the disease something which that military why don't they check what would be it's like military units you know something, something something like number two nine was four zero. Then you Google that military unit, and that military unit is uh, federal security office, and then you Google more and you find out that it's based near. Sochi residents of Vladimir Putin. So mm -hmm. that specific military unit is responsible mm -hmm. for the maintenance of the residences. And then, you know, we checked how these people were entered in other people's phone books, also through an app, and it would also be like, oh, episode, episode, episode. And then it would be like sometimes they would have a description like security or like key to link or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they call and then we checked their plane tickets, and it turns out that all of them would just on one day randomly from Sochi. Uh, take up and fly to Italy um, and like and then come back all of them together like um, okay it could have been like a short holiday that you take with your colleagues but that's basically like it's, it was work um, so like um, about 30 of them would be every time they would be flown to Milan or neighboring places um, in Italy and then they would have a week or two on the yacht and then they will be traveling back to Sochi to their military units and this is the way, so by proving that everybody employed and that you are um, um, Russian government uh, people, they are civil servants, and um, military people, um, we managed to, to, to prove that the CEO cannot be owned by an oligarch because that was an official, that was an official version. The official version was that who they not Mm -hmm. How would they not have access to? It's not what right? Well, he was. He, he was. was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, how would uh, like a retired uh, oligarch have, have, have access to uh, to presidential security service? Yeah, yeah. and um, they, the chairs had almost almost managed to get away. Um, even after our investigations, there was a point when it was ready to sail, and I think this is when Italians panicked. Uh, because they obviously leaked the story to New York Times again, saying that in 48 hours, the Shikharazad is ready to go. Um, and it still wasn't arrested. Uh, my colleagues then personally flew to the port. And they were like trying to like protest there, like meet someone, talk to people. And then I made a huge scandal like, on Twitter saying like, it's like we have hours to stop it. And it was like Friday evening. Um, or Thursday evening, so that for 24 hours on Twitter would be just like anybody who can do it, anybody who has uh, access to <clears throat> the financial police in Italy, we have to pull every string. And then on Friday evening, 24 hours later, um, like at 11 p.m., financial police officially releases a statement that Eduardo Kudelnata, who the, the nominee owner of that, has been sanctioned randomly out of every process, out of every cycle, just one person. And that allowed them to freeze the vote. Mm -hmm. And now, as we know, um, they are there is joint investigation in Germany, Spain, and Italy. I think, and that they are um, they have confirmed who paid for it. Um, the money were collected by the money was collected by Tim Schinke, 
uh, Ivan Dzimchenko, uh, you know, uh, he was a guest at Boyle Villa. Mm -hmm. They also, you know, first main director of intelligence, of course. Uh -huh. um, yeah, now they're just going, so they confirmed the value that uh, without interior, without just the like major works, plus some major interior works, was 600 million euros. So, um, so that's like without the, that's without battling and basis, you know, without decoration, but with refurbishment. Um, yes, a 600, 750 million dollars. Um, and so it's probably close to a billion if you add everything up like that. Um, so yeah, and now it's being frozen, it's and I really, hope, yeah, um, and I really hope that um, it will be confiscated, sold, and I don't know, the proceeds would go to Ukraine or something like that. So at least there will be some use. Out of this boat. How did you get, you know, the pictures of the interior design? We didn't. It was the sun. What? It was the sun. Ah, the, the British, British sun. How did they get? No idea. I would love to ask them. Uh huh. We had one or two pictures from inside. They weren't that flashy, um, and um, we had our source, um, the crew member, saying that everything inside is like super golden, like elevators, uh, gold, and everything is golden. And then there is like self-stabilizing pool table and then there is also a dance floor that converts into a swimming pool which really resembles like what is considered yes, in Paris, just in, like ah, and yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I have personally edited all of this the details out of our video saying like what do I call it Gerby? no one will believe us like we cannot like we don't have pictures we cannot just quote a source what if the source is fake what if whether he's making it up or exaggerating or something like that. I'm not going to write that everything is made of gold. This is just stupid. So I've edited it out into the film and then uh, with the, the video. And then two days later, the Sun, British Tabloid, <coughs> publishes pictures of everything being gold. And <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm mean, like my biggest failure as an editor. Like, I'm just completely, I should, should have just let this edit. This is very impressive, Masha. Very impressive. Okay, so, but you know, I understand that we have to turn to the questions, right? Up to you, we can keep, we can keep going back and forth. Uh, tell me guys, would you want, because you know, I can, I have questions, but you know, if you have your, uh, you know, if you want to ask much question, you have uh, 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 an opportunity to, to do it now. Or either I will keep going with my question. So just tell me how we, I will love to answer the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm just interested in what you're thinking about current situation with Navalny. Okay, we'll get to this. Uh, do you have a question regarding the investigations? I'm sorry, I don't see you. I'm sorry, that's why. Yeah. So, are you at every Can point you in time? Please, uh, you know, we, I keep people, uh, uh, if I don't know what they, and I can't sit from here. Yeah, I'm Shankar Satyana, ah, okay. the Department of Politics. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. My question is, uh, are you always evaluating the risk to you or them doing something to you? And at what point do you not care? I, I don't evaluate it. Uh, it's, um, it's a de decision that you take once. And after that, what's the point of coming back to it? I have seen my boss dying in front of me. Um, and that makes it very vivid, you know, the risks associated with this. And then you just, you, you take a decision. You just make a choice to keep going despite everything, whatever happens. This is what you can end up as. This is what can happen to you. But there's absolutely no point in going back to this every week and, you know, re, re, recalibrate it and all that. I don't think that there is anything that can possibly make me not do it. Okay. Could you give us an idea of your investigation department? Um, I don't, I don't mean you disclose every, every detail, but um, uh, are these people just enthusiastic uh, volunteers, or you hire high caliber professionals to do the investigations? I, I, I almost don't want to answer that question because I don't have, not because it's a secret, but I just don't want to um, discredit <laughs> ourselves. <clears throat> We're really not that fancy. For uh -huh. I've, I've worked for eleven years, mm -hmm. and for the majority of this time, for like nine years, it was just me and one other guy. Mm. It was two people. Sounds great. Yeah. Department. Um, so that was the department, 
And now recently, um, about a year and a half ago, I hired one more uh, professional investigator, um, ex-journalist, I think, not really journalist, so he is um, And we have an intern. So now it's uh, three and a half. That's it. Impressive. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Um, I, I'm Ivan Alexander, I'm from the politics department. Okay. So um, I watched the movie, the documentary about, by Daniel Rohr, oh. and it's about like how the, the, the whole situation with uh, Navalny actually took place, uh, like behind the scenes aspects of that. Uh, and there is like paramount view in that um, movie. And there is this part where Chris de Grote, uh tells about like his story, his like part in that story where he's like, oh, so I, I've never been like a fan of Navalny, but like I kind of stumbled across this, uh, this important facts and I had to report them. And in that movie, I almost got the feeling that you, you personally uh, were kind of hesitant about kind of interacting with him and you had some doubts about like how uh, genuine his kind of support is so could you like spill the beans about like mm -hmm. what what are the trade-offs when interacting with people from 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 outside like like Christo or like him well we didn't know much about his background uh, we didn't know. I, I, I was a fan of these investigations always. And from the day I learned of only was poisoned, I mean, we, we started our own investigation and we kind of met with Bellingham halfway through this investigation. Um, but I always knew that they would do it um, because how they work and because of the exclusive knowledge that they have about Novichok specifically um, from, from their screen file case. So obviously they, have, they, they knew the infrastructure and we knew the people. So you know they what was happening in Tomsk and Omsk, etc. Um, I always knew that Gun Cat would uh, do it and that they would um, probably figure out who who is behind it. But then every time I'm just I just have to do this quite literally my job to be careful about those things and to protect our organization from from, from something that can, something bad that can happen to it. Um, what if Christo worked or I don't know, intelligence service of a foreign country? We don't want that. As charming as he is, like we don't want that association. Um, what if he is? What if he is not good with his data? What if he is not as you know accurate and not as you know thorough with his work? Do I need to double check after him? Do I need to brief, brief and cross check things? So yeah, due to that, um, due to that, of course, I was um, I wasn't skeptical. I was just cautious about this. Um, and it took time, and I think it's, it's it's vastly exaggerated in the movie, the level of my, um, you know, just evilness and how, how cold I was. No, of course not, of course not, it wasn't like that. But I have to keep the distance with this sort of people. Just for example, so, so no one doesn't have to, right? So it's it's just the protocol, essentially, of how we work. And Krista turned out to be a wonderful person, and now he's a great friend of mine, and we've done loads of investigations after that. Um, and um, I was completely wrong if I ever thought that there is something wrong with him. My dad, I, when I was introducing Masha, I didn't say that she was a producer of this documentary, Navalny, which got the top prize uh, in, in documentaries from Sundance Festival. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, for those of you who didn't see the, this documentary, it's amazing thing. You definitely should. Uh, because uh, the key in this documentary, it's obviously, it's about Navalny. And Navalny, you know, after he got rehabilitated, you know, after this awful post, he basically died. His entire nervous system was just evaporated. He, at the, you know, at the beginning, you know, he was unable to recognize the love of his life, you know, his wife, Julia. He was describing this in one of his texts on Instagram that he just felt the warmth of somebody's hands and he felt that this somebody 
it's very nice, it's very warm, and if somebody was uh, uh, helping you with a pillow, he just didn't know who was that person. That bad was the situation that he couldn't see. Anyway, but he felt that, you know. Uh, and so it's, of course, you know, separate story how Julia, his wife, survived through that. It's another story. So, anyway, so, and after Navalny got on his feet, and that's perfectly his nature, you know, there was, you know, they were doing this investigation, you know, who tried to kill him. And uh, finally, you know, they got the name of the guy who apparently was one of those who followed him. And Navalny just called him on the cell. And he pretended, uh, I see, pretended that he was an assistant to General Patrushev. General Patrushev is uh, Jack Sullivan uh, of Russia, right? You know, the head of the National Security Council, uh, Secretary of Russia, it's called Secretary of National Security Council, KGB General, etc. So, and all of a sudden, the guy started talking. And he basically disclosed that they put the poison in his underwear. And his job was to clean this underwear so that, you know, just, you know, wrong people wouldn't find it. Anyway, so, and they put this all in the movie. But, you know, before the movie was released, they did this amazing investigation. And now I mean, Starts as saying, I now I know who not just who tried to kill me, but who are the people who did this? Where How did they, they do it? Us? Where they, they live, what their names are, what are the names of their wives and passport numbers. And such. So probably should roll this. Nice. So you know it's so, obvious. So <laughs> anyway, so this is it's just you have to see this. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, and of course, you know, you would expect Russian authorities after that to initiate it. Just pretend. Of course, you know, obviously no one, you know, private parties, no private party could get access to this military agent. But also you would expect Russian, uh, Russian uh, pro uh, procurators at least trying to pretend that they're initiating it. Not, never, just never. They didn't even pretend doing this. There was no investigation, not so. But that's what they did. Any questions? Is, yes, please. Uh, Maria Vinagradova, visiting scholar at the here at the Jordan Center. Maria, could you where you're from? Uh, I'm of, of meaning uh, academic, uh, academically or geographically. Geographically, yeah. <laughs> in Petersburg. Ah, very nice. Um, okay. And Maria, could you tell uh, a, bit, a bit more about your own background and how you became an investigator? <laughs> we spoke about this, you probably will. Uh, Sorry, I'll yeah, I was a few minutes late. Okay, okay. Oh, never mind. So, would you want to you know briefly repeat, or we we'll just ask I, I Maria to, uh, to go it. to the there will be recording so you can okay. get back to this? Uh, there was a question from somebody by the name Igor Timochev. Should we expect new investigations like us from Dimon and Putin's palace? Yes, Garrison. Garrison. What? What are you going to release? Sure. <laughs> I'm going to get your notepads out and get yourself. <laughs> no, seriously. Something interesting. Something big. When? Garrison. When? Okay, you know, just that's what point how it work. We never announce it, we never just a little you know, couple of sentences. What they what, what it's all about. It's about you won't believe it, it's about a corrupt government official who <laughs> 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 spent the entire life in government service, not a day in business, not a day anywhere else, and made money through a very serious conflict of interest. And they start having a lot of expensive properties. <laughs> and he's in government. Hmm? He's in government. Um, okay. Well, anyway, anyway I'm not the yes, chef, but government you know. official. Like I don't know. No, you know, you make this difference. <laughs> you know. 
<coughs> okay. Uh, another question from Leila Arutseva. Greetings, is a Bacar team open for research collaboration with social scientists? I'm researching corporate corruption when I previously reached out to journals consortium. Ah, the national consortium is in general, probably. Working on lit papers, <coughs> they said that only journalists are welcome to accept uh access the data that they may have who is uh what's the uh embarcar stance regarding uh, this type of collaboration uh well we we, we don't collaborate with um consortiums they we don't have access to the final papers and like that and with social science we've just never done it okay so you may give a try but trust me you don't have a luck okay um fish Hey, what would you recommend a recent PhD in political science looking at election and intergovernment subsidies in Russia to focus the study on? And what, what, I think. what is needed now in the area of Russian studies? Huh? And smart voting, I would recommend a PhD student um, or a recent graduate to, to who's interested in electoral politics to um, write a thesis on smart voting, the strategy that we've been pursuing for a number of years, uh, that, the strategy that Navalny came up with in 2018 or something, essentially a voting strategy that offers you to vote for the candidate um, who it has the highest chance of winning against the United Russia incumbent. It's very, it's, it's completely mathematical and, and that way we managed to get elected so many like um, members of local parliament and um it's a very effective strategy against the ruling party and um they've been fighting against it so much like well russian the russian government somehow managed to convince google to take uh, an apple to take our app down simple app that tells you who to vote for gives you a recommendation based on your address and um, it's very effective and it will be very interesting to study actually like how it worked and how then the 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 that results were rigged still using electronic voting. So that's that's what I would write um, my paper if I was to do that. Okay, there was a question. What's your name? Me. Me. Uh, about the state of Norway now. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. What do you think about this current situation? How they actually the, this war gonna impact this situation? Mm. How it's gonna be? I. It looks like it's worse and more worse yes, and worse. It does, it does. Yeah. And two months ago, maybe like months and a half ago, all of a sudden the this condition started to deteriorate quite 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 dramatically. They were I don't know why, well, I don't know what happened in August. It started in August, but it, I would be silly not to acknowledge that even his harsh and strict conditions for previous year and a half yeah. have changed. Something has happened. Um we don't know what. We don't know whether it's a response to the war didn't start in August. Do you still have any insight on that system to get some information house in next week? No, they cut off all the connections, all communications. He's sitting in the maximum security panel colony. How on top of that, uh we were, you know, I was trying to find that what's the English for that. There is a system which is called SUS, So inside this maximum security panel colony, and you know, his entourage are people who committed a couple of uh, murders. Uh, so um, he was he was sentenced to this strict uh means ways you know i don't know you know of uh detention so that in his previous kind of colony he had four uh uh four uh long-term uh meetings with his family his wife and his parents long-term means three days when he was sentenced and the uh, the court was inside the penal colony i was even i was there and you know so it was they, they set up the court inside the penal colony and in order to you know to to 
uh, testifying his behalf, you know. All of us, and I, of course, you know, I had to go through, you know, all this security stuff, etc. Not exactly the best experience of my life. So, uh, so there in this panel, so after he was sentenced to nine years in the maximum security uh, panel for nothing, for nothing, absolutely for nothing. He was just, it's a, it's a just totally fake. But everything about, you know, uh, his sentence is fake. Uh, he was moved uh, to this penal colony, strict penal colony, and now he had three long-term meetings with his family, and also his uh, ability to receive parcels with food because they are hungry all the time. Uh, they can receive one in, in his previous penal colony. He could receive four parcels worth twenty kilos. And in this new, in the strict uh, maximum security panel called the three parcel. And now, because of this uh, new sentence of the strict uh, uh, conditions of detention, he's going to have just two. He can use 9,000 rubles a month. It is not, it is, uh, it is 150 bucks to buy additional food in the prison kiosk. Because they're constantly hungry. You know, of course, you know, the, the, the kind of food that even though it's his, he, he wrote that it's better than it was in his previous. But Coleman is still, you know, he's a very tall guy and, you know, he once again lost a lot of weight and it's just hard to look at, at the pictures. So, and unfortunately now he's, they put him in the punishment solitary confinement. Did I say it right? It's like a punishment cell. It's a, a purpose-built cell, um, which looks like a solitary confinement, but like, even with, with worse conditions. So it's not about solitude. It's not about you being alone. There, <coughs> alone there. But it's about you being penalized for what, something that you've done wrong. So the worst part about that. Right. So yeah, he, he has not that he's on his own. That's fine. That they would, the fact that at 6 a.m. they like chain up your bed to a wall. Um, and it has to stay like that. So for the whole day, you're not allowed to lay down or anything like that. You just have to sit in the stall. There's one stall, there is one table. Made so out of steel. Um, and so you put that up, and then they will put it down just if it was the bedtime. And for the whole day, you have absolutely nothing to do. You are allowed to read one book per term. So you better get a long book, that, that's, that's a strategy. Um, and um, are you allowed to use something and paper for like one hour a day? Yeah, mm -hmm. one hour a day, right. So it is, it is harsh. They're trying yes. to break it. I, I, I've heard that even the prisoners can't can look at that. Yeah, they're not allowed to look at that. Would they scare something or it's just a torture for them? Okay. Okay. They're trying to break that's the idea. They they want to break it because you know Putin sees him as his real enemy. Now, what is your optimistic prognosis? What's happened after? We have to get him out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> What's happened with Putin after the Ukraine okay, was going to win? You. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry. Any more questions? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, hi, I'm uh, Miriam Elder. I two questions. You can decide if you want to just answer one. But the first is. Have you ever had any indication that people from inside the Russian government are supportive of your investigations in any way? And then the second question is, has the war in Ukraine changed the way you think about what to focus on with your investigations? Um, the answer to the first question is no. The, the, the people are not very keen to talk to us and communicate with us and being seen or associated with us. We don't have any sources inside it. And the war, yes, the war has changed our investigations a lot. Um, we now make sure that every investigation that we do has, um, for, has some foreign assets in there because we are quite quick in actually getting them arrested and frozen, just like using the Digital Heritage mm -hmm. example. We are, if you look into what we published this year, since the beginning of the war, it's all, um, it's all there, there is always, always a foreign property involved. One we did for Italian house, but here, here, the conductor, uh, we did like, like Italian. 
states from like from Milan to Venice. And every time we do, probably the actually Miller was the only exception, um, where we didn't have um, a foreign presence, well, apart from Ukrainian, like I said, Ukrainian and things like that. Um, yeah, so we tried to, so that's our way of like being efficient and effective. And we couldn't, and I, I derived some sort of personal pleasure from that because for years we've been losing uh, court cases in Russia um, because they were like corrupt. And uh, we would complain about most of its crimes and get a response that, oh, no crime, no evidence to crime. And here you actually get that. Here you can submit your complaint to um, a UK authority. So on uh, Lavrov's stepdaughter, for example, Alina Kavalova, who was when, when she was 22, she purchased a 4.4 million pound apartment in London and Kensington. Um, so we would complain about that. Uh, and she would get sanctions. So there is this you know, reward always there. So yes, with the beginning of the war, we started to work on that we started to closing down on them from the other side, where the rule of law actually exists. Yes, please. Uh, yes, just for, you know, yes, you're a uh, Where are you from? I'm not, not affiliated, but from uh, St. Petersburg. Okay. Not with the university. Uh, do you think that um, the extreme crackdown over the past year or two, you know, at ECA, you know, in a maximum security prison, can't even communicate through fog glass, um, the last few opposition figures that were in Russia getting arrested, Ilya Yashin, etc., your whole team, I think, I, I don't know, but I think, I imagine everyone is outside of Russia, most can't be in the country, so I imagine you're in you know, flying a drone is harder if you can't be there. Um, has that made it harder to do all of these investigations? Yeah. Like a lot harder? Um, uh, they have I, closed down all of the like registers, property registers. They are erasing corporate registers in Russia as well. And very soon you will not be able to find out your own uh, legal entity, which is a complete disaster. They have erased half of uh, Cadastral maps, um, they are useless as well. Yes, it's difficult to buy drones now because we cannot do it anymore ourselves. Right. But so far, so good. We still there are there are ways. You know, when they close down on something, it means that that data is very likely to start being sold on the black market. So we can do that. You know, there are always like ways around, and even if they shut everything down, well, we will look for their properties abroad. <laughs> still a lot of work to do. Right. Oh, one. Follow up, just curious. Uh, when Alexei was going back to Russia, was there any hope, you know, the team internally, and you were part of the team to some extent, uh, or to a big extent? Uh, any, was there hope that, you know, uh, he would, you know, not be sentenced yeah. to a life sentence extension? Which one is kind of what he is. Okay. So they exceeded even your. Yeah, we prepared for the worst. We prepared for the worst. <laughs> Uh, we planned for the worst, and as you can see, the anti corruption foundation works just as well as it did before. We didn't have any, you know, breakdown because I let's say uh, was not with us. Um, so we planned everything perfectly, but we still have stuff. Yes, no, uh, just, uh, yes, I'm sorry, what's your name? Uh, Sophia Karajan. Yeah, hi. Um, so I know that you are the biggest anti corruption and opposition party in. Um, in Russia and with the current war going on, I just wanted to ask your opinion of um, Crimea and particularly whether you support it returning to Ukraine. I think that it's a question that is not going to be resolved in any time in, 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 the, in, in the near future. Um, what happened to Crimea is, I mean, what's there to, to, to discuss? It has been annexed, it has been unlawfully acquired uh, by Russia using a mechanism of a fake referendum, a referendum that was entirely staged and didn't, uh, didn't really um, look like um, um, people, you know, have a way of people, for people to express their opinion. So I think that one day they may be another referendum, a real, a real one, the one where people can actually be asked what they want to be. But uh, given the war and everything that's happening there, I think that's uh, this question has been moved even further away. Uh, Vlad Borlaski, I believe. Uh, some folks are claiming that you have been cooperating with the hacked community. 
put it a uh, command on that. Okay. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Yes, but uh -huh. I just um, I, I, I I don't see because of the call. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, Barbara Chinano, I'm not affiliated with the university. Um, do you feel that how how is the interest of your investigation changes throughout the time, and what actually spikes the interest, and and what how it is right now? Because we all feel that. The interest towards Ukraine is declining. The interest yeah. towards Russia has and Navalny has been declining for quite some time already. Um, you have the back end data of your of your views, etc. Um, how is it now, and what do you want? It's not actually that bad. I was scared that uh, Alexei was the face of our investigations for, for the whole time since YouTube existed, um, and so of course I was very concerned that with his uh, departure. With, 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 without him talking to the viewer as they used to, our our views will fall, and um, it will not be the same because I don't know who would want his, who would want to look at me compared to him or to Georgi or compared to Alexei. It's like we thought that we might lose some audience, but such words, the numbers are pretty similar to, to what it was with on on our regular investigations. Not on that Putin's palace, but separate. But normally, like we would before the poisoning, we would uh, do an investigation and probably get like a, a so so one will get three million views, a good one will get 10. And we are pretty much on the same numbers, really, like for, for whatever we published this year, it's all about like six, seven million views. So that's good numbers almost. Right. So, yeah. um, With, I guess that's that genre, it just doesn't, mm -hmm. just doesn't die. And just, just to follow up on that, do you think that? By making more investigation, you will reach a breaking point at some point that would actually make more Russian people that are not interested in this right now mm -hmm. interested in this topic. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, we did it with Invader, where essentially with, with, with the investigation of Invader, where like, there is a whole generation who got political because of that investigation. They like they work for us now, or sometimes they just chat to me in the streets and say, oh. I got into politics after watching that investigation. Right. Um, that was 2017. Now, now there is another generation probably with, with Putin's palace. Um, and uh, as I said in the beginning of this conversation, for us, it's not about just investigations, it's not about the art of investigating. It's, it's, it, it's political. And of course, we're using it as a language, as a language to, 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 to um, try to reach those people who want to reach using very very simple statements like corruption is bad stealing is bad they are robbing you then this mad money isn't just the money from, from, from the air this is you this from your pocket you know like by building that i think well, that has worked so far if we come up with a more effective way i mean we'll use it but uh, this is this is obviously a big 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 tool investigation Yes, but hi, um, my name is Natalia and I'm from Moscow. Um, we are from Moscow. We are from Moscow? Yeah. Uh, Adensovsky Rayon. Ah. Uh, Not bad. I did so this is where we play drinks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Maria, thank you so much for what you're doing. And because of you, I'm, you know, I'm not ashamed of my country because of you and some, you know, a lot of journalists. You know. My question uh, to you would be this when you do a corruption investigation. Um, obviously, you're focusing on Russia and Russian politicians, but do you also, by you know, by association, I guess, uh, do you find corruption where other countries are involved, other you know politicians from other countries? And if so, do you have an inclination to you know whistle blow to politicians in other countries? Oh, I mean, I would love to do a story about. Uh, Russian uh, Russian government corrupting a foreign government official, like I don't know, like Marine Le Pen or one of those. Um, <clears throat> it's like it's, it's it's genuinely like a career aspiration of mine to do it one day. Um, up until now, understandably, understandably, that hasn't been our main focus um, because we are very Russia focused completely and entirely. But if if the chance comes, it's like we have a leak, leak, or if I, I just stumble across something. 
that would point in that direction, I would jump on that story and do it because I think that would be amazing to do this with that. Going for Alexander, 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 Alex
uh, we probably you know uh, we have to you know to round up this, but you know I want to ask you. Uh, on the one hand, it's clear that you are very interested in getting out of the, in getting the information out, especially uh, information about the corruption of the uh, government politicians. At the same time, you say that you have a political agenda. Yeah. Is it to say that you would want to go into politics one day or another? Would you run for elected like politics? Probably not. So you are not planning on going to politics. No. So you will keep doing this investigation. I if I could do it in a different capacity, like I don't know, with, with the proper capacity of, of, of with the resources of you know and actually being able to prosecute people for what they've done. Um I I'd do that. So I'm more on the on, on that side. Like I don't I'm not sure I have this. You have to have a certain number of um, personality traits to, to, to be able to run for an office, to, to, to be likable, to be able for the audience, to be able to engage your supporters and things like that. I'm not sure I have it. And I, but at the same time, I'm sure that I have the stubbornness and uh, attention to detail and um, passion for revenge that is required, <laughs> that is required in the beautiful Russia of the future. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much for those models.